Hi, this is Justin Colletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for some more MixCon. And today we've got a panel moderated by the great Maureen Droney, the Senior Managing Director of the Producer and Engineers Wing of the Grammy Foundation, also known as NARIS, the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. These are the people who put on the Grammy Awards every year. And Maureen has got with her four amazing panelists, all producer engineer managers for some of the biggest producers and engineers working today. They're going to be talking about the role of a producer engineer manager, when you should think about getting one, what it takes to get on the roster of a top producer manager, what they do for their clients, how they help shape careers, what the role of a manager is in the life of a producer or engineer. I think it should be an interesting and insightful one. Really excited to hear from Maureen and her panelists. Let's get right into it. Before we do, I want to let you know that you can sign up to win thousands upon thousands dollars worth of free stuff over at the MixCon Mega Giveaway. You can check that out at sonicscoop.com slash MixCon Giveaway. That's sonicscoop.com slash MixCon Giveaway. Thanks so much for the Grammy Foundation Producer Engineers Wing of Naris for helping us out with putting on this panel. Should be a great one. I'm going to hand it over to Sonic Scoop co-founder David Weiss, who's going to take it away. Remember to hit like and subscribe down below and ask us your questions and give us your thoughts on the roles of managers in the careers of producers, engineers, and musicians. All right, let's get into it. David, Maureen, take it away. Hey, everyone. I'm David Weiss, editor at sonicscoop.com. It's great to have you here with us. Welcome to Producer Mixer Managers, Guiding Audio Careers. Thank you to the P&E Wing for sponsoring this amazing panel. For those of you who are not familiar, members of the Producers and Engineers Wing work together to shape the future of music recording. As a Recording Academy membership division, the P&E Wing advises the Academy on technical matters related to recording and also addresses matters of concern to producers, engineers, remixers, manufacturers, technologists, and other related professionals. Visit www.grammy.com to learn more about this awesome organization. Now, on to the panel. Everyone's CV is too long to list all their accomplishments. I had the tough task of condensing their bios so we could get to the convo. To all these distinguished panelists, my apologies if I left out anything you consider essential. Please don't hesitate to add on any additional highlights. I just want to add that it's hard to believe that everyone here in this panel is technically competitors because you'll never meet a more congenial group ready to work together and share information. It's been a privilege working with all of you here to put this panel together. So thank everyone uh, for being here with us today. Uh, so now here is everybody in alphabetical order by last name. Trina Bowman. Trina, say hi. Hello, everyone. All right, that's Trina. Trina Marie Bowman is founder and CV CEO of LVE Enterprises. She's an avid advocate for producers, songwriters, and artists' rights in education. LVE Enterprises provides services in management, publishing, consulting, A&R consulting, and GM services. Former and current noteworthy clients of Trina's include Harvey Mason Jr., Tommy Brown, Eric Hudson, Mike Daly, and Dwayne Whitmore, to name a few. Collectively, that's a group who's produced and collaborated with Ariana Grande, Selena Gomez, Justin Bieber, John Legend, Justin Timberlake, Kanye West, Chris Brown, Dance, and Nick Jonas. You can visit Trina at lve-enterprises.com. Trina, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes, good to have you. All right, Joe D'Ambrosio. Joe, say hello. Hello, everyone. Hey, Joe. Joe D'Ambrosio enters his 18th year representing world-class producers, engineers, mixers, arrangers, composers, songwriters, musicians, and executives with his company, Joe D'Ambrosio Management, JDMI. JDMI represents such talent as the legendary music producers Tony Visconti and Hugh Padgham, legendary mixers such as Elliot Shiner, Joe Zook, Frank Filippetti, Kevin Killen, and brilliant renowned arrangers such as Larry Gold and Rob Mouncey. And I'll add that Joe is a 28-year Recording Academy member. Visit Joe at jdmanagement.com, a website I've been to many times. Jeremiah Grabner. Jeremiah, say hi. Hello, everybody. Hey, Jeremiah. 
Uh, Jeremiah is a Los Angeles-based entrepreneur and creative executive working in the music industry since 1994. He has held A&R executive positions at A&M Records and Wyndham Hill Records and was the founder of RPM Direct. Presently, he is the founder, co-founder and CEO of GPS Management in Santa Monica, representing a select roster of producer, engineer, and mixer clients. His clients include Vance Powell, or their clients, I should say, include Vance Powell, Ethan Johns, Joe Ciccarelli, Greg Feidelman, Matty Green, Tucker Martin, and Ryan Hewitt, among others. Visit Jeremiah at globalpositioningservices.net. All right. Welcome, Jeremiah. Thank you. Yeah, good to have you. And now, Junior Regis Registford. Junior, salutations. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey, Junior. Junior Registford is an extremely diverse entertainment industry executive with experience as a music publisher, A&R executive, music supervisor, artist manager, producer manager, and partner of a major, and president, to partner of a major record label management film entertainment company. Junior has worked with a long list of multi-platinum superstars, including Lady Gaga, Jennifer Lopez, Nicki Minaj, Slum Village, French Montana, Enrique Iglesias, and many more. His current and former managed producer songwriter clients include Red One, Adam Anders, Derek Big Tank Thornton, the composer PK, and the busy producer songwriter Destin Hill. You can visit Junior at New Heights Ent. Dot com. Junior, glad to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And finally, our moderator, Maureen Droney. Maureen is a former audio engineer and now the Senior Managing Director of the Producers and Engineers Wing of the Recording Academy, which is the organization behind the Grammy Awards. She's also the author of several books and hundreds of magazine articles about audio and recording. Most importantly, Maureen is a longtime friend of mine and former colleague at Mix Magazine. Maureen, it's always good to be reunited with you, uh, live or virtually. Thank you, David. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. here with all of these people. One thing I want to tell people, if you do want to reach the, or find out more about the Producers and Engineers Wing, the P&E Wing, the easiest way to find us, because the Grammy website is so full of stuff, is to go to Producers and A-N-D, ProducersAndEngineers.com. And you can find out more about us and our best practice documents and things like that. So, All right. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I'm going to start with the very basic question of what is a producer manager and, and what is it you actually do? And I'm going to toss that to Joe, I think, uh, to start. What does a producer manager do? We do a lot of things. We, um, we look for work. We negotiate deals. We um, match the right producer, engineer, mixer, arranger with the right artist. Um, we keep up on trends. We, we listen to music. We do our very best to look after the people we represent with as much integrity as possible in, in a world that seems to be losing that rapidly. Whoa, that was great. That was deep. Um, Trina, what, what would you say as what is your role as a producer manager? I believe the latter of his statement was extremely valid. And that's one of the reasons why I've become that much more passionate about the work that I do. Um, but to answer your question, it, it's, it's very, it, it's all encompassing in the sense of having creative contributions and knowing how to pair producers and writers to get the best outcome of a creative collaboration for a song and knowing what artists they may work well with. And that's not just through Sonic, that's through personalities as well. But most importantly is making sure um, that our clients have a career and aren't just one hit wonders um, and that they have longevity and that there's room for them to grow and blossom into other ventures as well. Yeah. Um, Junior, what do you do as a producer manager? What how would you describe it? Well, I would include everything that both of them just said. <laughs> and then I would add on to that, you know, really trying to find out where your producer, writer, composer, what they do best, help them amplify that. Um, because lots of times they can get into a space where they want to do everything, but there are certain things that they do that they have special sauce that they're really good at. 
you try to help them nurture that skill set and then surround it with a surround them with like a team that can help facilitate the things that maybe they don't do as well so they can be more efficient and work faster and then you keep them in a better space and keep them happy so they can continue to be productive um so there's a lot of sort of nuance in knowing what your producer or writer is good at helping them lean into those things and then helping you know compensate and add to the team to help build out a fuller sort of delivery of music and records in the areas where they may not be as polished and for each producer it's it's different you figure that out with each client what works best for them so i would say i would add that piece to along with the other things that they already said because we do all those things as well so it's very personal and you're part of their team correct you 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 kind of you 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 become a creative partner in a way with them you know you give them all the credit you know we're still wallpaper in the background at the end of the day though but you are sitting in a room helping them craft what they're doing giving them directions getting their mind right so they can access the right stuff because you you kind of know your client and when they work their best but you are sort of a creative partner with them as well um but you're just doing that from the standpoint to help them be productive. And Jeremiah, definition or personal take on it? Well, I would have to add um, all of those things that these guys have all said is all true. Put that on my list. Um, in addition to those things, I would I would add, you know, um, oftentimes we are confidants, consigliers to our clients. Um, we talk about aspirations creatively, deep personal uh, issues that may be going on with a particular client, whether it's uh, having to do with their own relationships, marriages, uh, financial stuff, um, things going on in their own personal lives. We really do become um, counselors in a way because as Junior was just saying, like in order to be um, creatively successful, to be productive, to be, you know, to have your head in the game when you're in the studio or uh, collaborating with someone creatively, all those life distractions that are kind of, you know, coming in at you like, hey, can I pay my mortgage? Can I pay my kid's tuition? Um, you know, all those things can be deterrents from being a successful creative collaborator. And so oftentimes our jobs is to counsel our clients who in nearly every instance, they become our friends. We're, we're bonded. We are in partnership. And when they succeed, we succeed. But when they're troubled or burdened or anything, if we're able to play a role in helping to ease that stuff, um, it oftentimes allows our clients to go into a, clear, a creative collaboration with a clearer, um, clearer mind, which is hopefully going to have a better result. Wow, it makes me feel I, I, I want that. <laughs> I want somebody who does all that. That's, is there, as a producer manager, what don't you do? And anybody can answer that. Okay. I'll jump in. Sure, um, well, Joe mentioned at the beginning, we look for work. And that is certainly true. We're constantly um, working our relationships, developing new relationships, seeking out uh, opportunities for our clients. You know, uh, I do lots of cold calls, lots of cold emails, outreach to people that we've never done business before, um, trying to develop connections so that we can introduce our clients, their work. And if there's a particular artist that maybe a manager or an A&R executive is looking after, trying to ingratiate ourselves and put our client's name and their work on the radar so that they're in contention for, um, for a particular project. That said, we are not um, employment agents. You can't sign up with a producer manager and suddenly be, you know, I'm not handing out gigs. I don't have that ability. God bless me if I could, because I'd be handing them out to everybody that we work with. Um, we look for work. We often do procure work. And those of us who, you know, have been doing this for a long time, we have a lot of relationships. Um, we can bring uh, historical work and those relationships to bear on other clients and so on. But at the end of the day, we can't guarantee we'll get anybody work. And that's, that's a misconception I think that folks have when they look at what producer management does, engineer management. Um, but it's important to understand the distinction. Anybody else want to comment on that? Just to add to what Maya said, um, that is the biggest red flag when you are interviewed or you interview someone to represent them 
And they say to you, so you're going to bring me all this work, aren't you? And the answer is, we're going to bring you some work. We're not going to bring you all this work. If we controlled it, as Maya said, it would be a very different situation for all of us. Um, and I would have less gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Or, well, you're all in agreement on that, I think. Uh, yeah. Totally in agreement. And I think one thing to add is once the, the commencement of the relationship should be viewed more as a, a partnership than relying on your manager to to kind of spearhead your career. Um, I think that's so I think it was well said by by both um, Jeremiah and Joe. Yeah. And I would only add it, it, that answer comes in for me like like that decision I is kind of made before I even engage with a producer because I'm not going to be a partner or be a manager of someone who's not motivated on their own and doesn't have a drive, doesn't have a vision of what they want to do. They better at least have an idea. You know, if five years from now, where would you like to be? You should be able to tell me, oh, I'd love to pr produce this or develop this act. I can't create the, the drive and the motivation for that client to work. They need to be driven and they need to have an idea. So now a manager and a partner can really help put a timeline and a plan to that to execute it. And then along the way, we'll be able to bring other resources and work as we on on that journey. So from the onset, what I don't do is get in partnership or working with a client that I don't feel has the proper motivation and drive. I think the word that sticks out to me is partnership. And I think I've learned that from some of you that I know well, um, that it, it really is a partnership and um, a team, part of yeah. a team. So everybody you know, contributes to it. Um, when you're taking on a new client, um, what are you looking for and what makes someone a good fit? I mean, I'm assuming you need a diverse roster of talent as well, because otherwise people, you know, people with different styles, otherwise, how do you decide what projects you may come across that are best for each client? So I'm kind of combining two questions because I think they fit together about what you're, what you're looking for in someone you would consider taking onto your roster. Um, um, uh, I can start. Um, for me, and I think everyone probably has their own preference. I prefer, I like to have, and if we're just talking specifically producers, I like producers that are musicians. Um, there are producers that have the ability to bring people together and to create and, and, and still produce a record. But I find that the producers that have the longevity are the ones that tend to at least play one instrument, play one or two instruments, have the ability to evolve with music and chords so no matter what trends are happening, you can continue to evolve and stay relevant. And I found that that model for me works well with a driven musician producer because now that person can live on the contemporary music space delivering product for major labels. And in my particular case, I've had producer writers that have been able to now compose and write for film, have become now music supervisors. I have one that's was a producer now music supervises five shows hit tv shows on air right now but that all started because you can continue to evolve as a musician so that's just one of the things i like i like musician producers that have some sort of skill set on one or two instruments because they're able to continue to evolve and learn music and, and evolve well it's interesting you say that because uh I would say in the past, the definition of a producer was sort of ineffable, right? Because right. their styles were different. It could be an engineer producer, a writer producer, a vibe producer, and that could yes. be valid, you know, right. Um, right. someone who was into pre-production, um, not naming any names, but uh, pre-production producers more yep. than actually hands-on in the studio. So, um, but things have changed in terms of revenue, et cetera, right now. So um, what you said about looking for people who, I mean, obviously, with any of those kinds of producers, being a musician would help or having a musical background. But yes, yes. Um, Joe, what do you look for? I look for, as I mentioned earlier, integrity. Um, they have to be impeccable. They have to deliver when they say they can deliver. They have to keep their word. I also look for their ability to communicate. Um, they are artists in their own right. Artists tend to uh, walk their own walk. And uh, how do I put this gently? Um, be, be different than, than most other people. That's part of their creative genius. But I demand and need people to be able to communicate with me, and I've gotten that from the people I represent. 
Because if you can't communicate to me, how can I communicate to the people who want to hire you to what you're able to do, how you can do it, and what timeline? Um, I need to know your ability, and you have to work with me toward that end. I need to have someone who communicates well. Trina? I, I second both Junior and Joe, all great state, both great statements. Um, I think that Junior kind of touched on it too in, in your response to your previous question, which is just motivation. You know, are you willing to get up every single day and dedicate your day to your craft? Um, communication is so, so key. Joe, thank you for so much for bringing that up because there's deadlines, there's timelines, records need to be delivered, files need to be delivered for mixing. Um, and it's so important to know that even if you're one of the greatest talents in the world, if you're not communicating and there's no means to an end to meet a deadline, then it can be, we can be put between a rock and a hard place and it, it kind of puts a, um, a bad taste on our reputation too. So I definitely speak on that. As far as looking for clients, I too love to work with musician driven producers. Um, I'm also, I do have like even myself some programmers on my um, roster that work well with other musicians. So if you are just a programmer, I just need to know that you can collaborate with musicians and find your sweet spot to round off a record. Another thing I, when I first started in produce, uh, produce songwriting management, particularly producer, is having um, producers that could finish their records. You know, um, there's a lot of people that are great starters, but maybe don't know how to round it off to bring it all together. And that's even just doing a rough mix to round off the sound really well. Um, I feel that having producers in your rosters that are finishers, not necessarily mixers, but finishers, is, is a great um, addition as well. That's one of my definitions of a producer. You get the job done. Yeah. You, get, you make the record. You get the record made. You know, uh, Jeremiah, um, when you're looking for, um, what are you looking for? It's pretty basic for me. Um, I have to be a fan of your work. I have to be able to like go out there and evangelize for what you do uh, and believe it because I believe it. If I don't believe in what you do, if I'm not a fan of your style, if I'm not a fan of the you know, style of music you work on or the, or the records you've made, it's going to be hard for me to go out there and pitch you for future work. Um, I also uh, need to have a personal connection with the people that I represent. Um, we don't need to be best friends um, because this is a business relationship after all, but we talk every single day. We text every day. We're in constant contact and kind of like following what, what Joe was saying, it's like the ability to communicate is absolutely crucial. So, you know, for me to have a really um, sort of strong personal rapport with the person that I'm working with um, is absolutely critical. And then all those other things that, um, you know, Junior and, and Tina were both saying, it's like, you know, someone who has a diverse skill set, someone who can um, be able to sort of morph into different roles and different projects, depending on what it is. Um, that's important. But end of the day, for me, it's personalities. If I don't like your records and I don't like you, <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> Trina, did you have your hand up to add something? Oh, no, sorry. Just a little okay. scratch. <laughs> um, okay. Um, does anybody want to comment on how you decide among your roster when you find out about projects who who would be the best for them and keep, you know, I mean, if you've got quite a few people on your roster, I'm sure they're all wanting to work. And when you come across projects, is, is that a tricky situation to decide who you pitch or how does that I've got, work? I've got 20 clients and it's really hard because and the folks that I represent a lot have shared skill sets. And you've got to focus really hard on who's going to do the best job always. Um, and it's part of what a manager does. You, you plug the right people in the right place. And you should know, not hope, that it's going to work out. Because you get to know the strengths and weaknesses of those you represent. So your clients need to really trust you. That you're, that's what you're oh, doing. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. It's, you're right. It's, it's, Does look, everybody feel like that or what, have any other answers to that issue? I would say he kind of nails it. It really comes down to who's going to deliver on the gig because at the end of the day, you can want to have everyone included, but you as a manager, you have a relationship and you have a reputation as well, dealing with labels and other clients. 
you want to be able to continue to deliver for folks so they come back to you so you can have more work to offer your clients. So for me, I always try to figure out who's going to deliver on this the best. And sometimes it's not even like how good of a producer it is. It might be this person's personality. This producer's personality is probably a better match for this particular artist in the room. So they'll probably get a better result. These two are too much the same because like Joe said, you know, producers are, are artists as well. So I have to watch who's in the right rooms. Some of them have the ability to work with anyone. Some of them work well with a certain type of artists. So that plays a role as well. You're making me remember when I was an assistant engineer at a, at a large studio and the, one of the studio manager's best talents was knowing which assistant engineer to put on which session and yeah. which was going to work and who is going to be the right person for that. So it sounds like that's what you guys do and you have a trust basis with your with your clients that you're looking out for all of them. Yes. Um, uh, all of you, I think, uh, maybe specialize in different areas or have different approaches to your business and variations in how you work. So um, give some examples of what you're working on in any given day. So maybe start with uh, Trina. Any given day, what I'm working on. Well, it's a range of things just because, you know, I not only work here domestically, I've worked in the K-pop market for eight plus years now, too. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and as that has evolved, um, you know, the demand for music and collaborations, more importantly, I'm getting a lot of requests for, can you help us collaborate with domestic artists? Um, so any given day, it's a matter of uh, reviewing records, which is extremely important for pitch. Um, also reviewing deals, negotiations, speaking to attorneys, speaking to label ARs, other artist managers, um, other artist managers, excuse me, and as well um, coordinating collaborative and successful sessions um, to get the best results. That's pretty much it in, in, in the nutshell for me. So you might attend sessions a lot with your clients or? Yeah, I, absolutely I do. Or we'll have um, review meetings. We'll, we'll sit down and we'll allocate a time to just go through the latest records they've been working on. Or, you know, I have one on my roster that's still scared to send music via email. So the only way for me to hear what's going on is to walk to the studio. So absolutely. And I love being a part of the creative process. I, I it's, it's my favorite. Um, so if I can be a part of, you know, of what's going on creatively, I absolutely would like to be. It's a little harder this year, but for the most part, yeah, yeah. Jeremiah, do you go to the studio much or how do, what are you doing during the day? Um, not so much anymore uh, yeah. this year, well, but yeah, yeah not, for sure. Not um, this year. Oftentimes dropping by the studio at the right moment, whether it's, you know, sort of in the, in the, uh, appropriate time when you're not going to be a distraction. I mean, not, you know, I'm, I'm not there to, um, you know, win any points with the band or the label or anything like that. It's really just to sort of check in on people. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we're working on uh, a dozen or more projects at any given moment. And so my time is best used, you know, in the office, on the phone, in front of my computer, um, or not in the studio, but taking meetings with people, managers, a and our executives, publishers, um, in their offices, out to lunch, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, dropping by the studio is now more like dropping by our clients' homes because um, mm -hmm. practically everybody is working from home um, and have been even pre-COVID. Um, obviously, there are those projects where you're, you know, tracking dates at a studio or whatever. Um, it's always fun to pop in from time to time to those, but um, most of the time it's dropping by our clients' personal studios, which gives us a chance to catch up on all kinds of other business beyond whatever the current project at hand is. is. Joe and Junior, anything you guys want to add to that that's different for you? Um, I would say that all of the above, and you know, I try to every day connect with the producer you know, because each one has a different sort of arc and plan of, of where they're trying to, you know, conquer the world. Each one has a plan to, to, to kind of, you know, build their business up and out. And for one producer, it may be, you know, getting more placements on particular acts. It's another producer, it's getting songs placed, but it's also they have two artists that they're developing, that they're working on, that we're looking to go and then shop and go get a deal for those artists. It's helping 
move the ball along every day with a client on what should be going next for their particular plan. In addition to contracts, uh, just like Trina says, I am dealing a lot with overseas. I'm, I'm dealing a lot with a huge label in Japan and doing collaborations with that artist here in the U.S. and actually finding a feature for the, for the song to be released in the U.S. here and in Japan with one of the producer client songs that were placed. So I'm actually going further than just placing the song. I'm actually helping the label work here in the States, but creates more opportunities for the producers here too. That contract negotiations um, and just keeping them focused, keeping them focused on what they need to be doing because there's a lot of distractions. Um, some producers want to be artists. That can be a plus, it can be a distraction, depends. So it's managing all those things in addition to what was already said. Joe, I think you had something to say or something to add. No, I agree with everyone. I think um, something Junior touched on is that we, we have to manage expectations all the time. And what very few clients understand is the flow from the first phone call to the final invoice is so much, so many emails, so many phone calls, so yeah. much conversation. Uh, I'm going through it now with a big artist. And... The producer drops the ball to the arranger. I have the arranger. And the arranger says, where's the song? And the producer's very big. And I said, when he gets it to you, he will. And it came today. You just have to temper expectations. You've got to always be the positive one, always be uh, absolutely confirming that it's going to go well until it doesn't. Right. And most times it does. Right. Well, I think all of you have heard me say that... I I always say that no one works harder than the producers and engineers except for their managers. And, and what you guys are explaining about your days and the process is um, making me even more of your fan. Um, what are the main sources of income for your clients? Uh, Joe. Labels, independent artists, films, television, um, games. Um, Songwriting, producing, mixing, arranging. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing things. Guys, jump in. Neighboring yeah. rights income. Ah, uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Sound exchange. Sound exchange, mm -hmm. um, neighboring rights. Um, you know, it's, it's so funny. It's longer to answer that question now because the business is so fragmented. Yeah. It's, it's so many, now there's so many lanes of revenue, potential revenue you can make. So it's like seven, eight different lanes you can pick. Um, so I have some that are making money on film and TV. I have some that are making money delivering to libraries that deliver to film and TV shows. And they're fine with that. They, that, that helps them because it gives them access to putting artists that they're developing on some of these songs that gets up getting placed on these TV shows to help build that. There's producer royalties, there's producer fees, obviously there's publishing. In some cases, you may be able to get writer fee for our, our top liner um, that will go into a studio. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of different places to manage now. That, yeah, and that's what I'm thinking. With all yeah. of those different sources, they all have different kind of construction and what yes. you have to do and the, what the agreements are and and um, what the process is, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was uh, wondering, wait, um, uh, if I could jump in. Yeah. Could, you, um, could one of you explain neighboring rights for, for our viewers who might not know what that is? I think you'd have to start with sound exchange, right? Would that be well, it? Yes and no. So I'll jump in. Um, neighboring rights is basically if you're a performer on a song, you don't have to be a songwriter. You can be the person that sings background, that is the engineer, that plays piano, that plays guitar. If you perform on a song, you get royalties on that record as a performer. But it's only been happening outside the US. So you go get that income generated for you outside the US. US is the only one that hasn't been doing it until now where Sound Exchange has now started doing that for US. But this has been going on for years for artists and performers overseas, the neighboring rights. 
So I think there was a, a treaty. It's the is it the Rome Accord? The Treaty of Rome in nineteen fifty yeah, four. And I think at the time, the only non signatories uh, to the treaty were North Korea. Iran and the United States and us. So, there you go. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah we, we've had a lot of success with neighboring rights collection. Um, and it is interesting as junior was describing how whatever role you, uh, you play on, per, on, as a performer, uh, on a recording, um, can generate royals, royalties for you. It's different, uh, territory by territory. Some countries have their own, uh, rules and uh, and so on around what is um, what counts. Um, so I always tell my my producer clients or engineer clients, whatever whatever you do, play a shaker on a track, like anything that will I'll bell you know, something, <laughs> something you know, <laughs> hand claps, whatever will get you listed as a musician or or a you know performer uh, in the uh, in the label copy. Um, can qualify you for neighboring rights collection. Um, it's, it's a little daunting to know how to navigate all the different territorial differences. We've been using a, an agency based in London for a long time um, who you sort of sign everything over to them. They run the gauntlet with, with registrations and everything else in all the various territories and then report back, you know, quarterly with what they've been able to collect. And it's a, uh, in the beginning, it was astonishing. Uh, how much money we were able to collect and how much money is out there for people that they, they probably don't know exists for them. Um, and it's just a matter of, you know, either affiliating with the various performing rights organizations in each territory or finding an agency to help you collect. Um, I, I think that just points to why people need producer manager. <laughs> these are, these are like the, the intricacies, uh, the, the, that it's your job to know <laughs> that the, the producer or mixer pro probably doesn't want to deal with. Uh, well, it's incredibly time-consuming to do all mm -hmm. of that. The U.S. does pay performance rights if for internet radio and satellite radio. So if it's a um, like a pure play, non-interactive radio station, um, then they collect monies for the performers in the United States, and they also collect from Sirius XM satellite yep. radio. Um, but now, to do those things, though, as long as we're getting, like you brought it up, David, so we're going to dive into this a little bit, because I was going to um, talk about contracts and also letters of direction. So, um, Jeremiah, you've been sort of a leader with the letters of direction thing. Not that all of you haven't been, Joe. Certainly you were there too, and um, Junior, you guys. Um, but do you want to explain how letters of direction work as briefly and succinctly as possible? You can. Sure. Um, in the United States, when an artist and a producer or a mixer decide to work together, um, there's this sort of, you know, thin line between the artist and the label, the artist is technically hiring the producer or the mixer. The contract is between the producer or mixer and the artist. Uh, whereas in every, everywhere else in the world, that contract is between the artist, I'm sorry, the um, producer or mixer and the record company. So in, in the United States, when you do a producer agreement, um, you are um, essentially in business directly with the artist, the artist then through what is known as a letter of direction, which is an addendum, if you will, to the producer contract, uh, that letter of direction is from the artist to the label, instructing the label to please adhere to these contractual, you know, terms that I've agreed to with this producer attached to this, um, producer agreement. And it's the artist instructing the label to pay that producer in advance to afford them the credit that's in the contract and um, any other sort of, you know, relevant details in the contract. Without it, the label won't pay. Um, the label will say, we have no instructions from the artist. We don't, we don't have any, um, you know, green light from the artist to, to pay you. And so the letter of direction is absolutely critical. It, you, your clients won't get paid and they won't be accounted to properly. Um, and in certain cases, um, you know, with the um, 
sort of constant changing of hands of ownership of catalog and, and other things where rights are assigned from one uh, label to another through some transaction or merger or acquisition or whatever. Um, if you don't have a signed, fully executed producer agreement with a letter of direction from the artist to the label, you're going to have a hard time chasing down royalties. You're going to be eliminating your ability to audit and all these other things. So, um, whether it's a sound exchange letter of direction, which is effectively the same thing, which is the artist instructing sound exchange to pay a royalty from their share to that producer or mixer, um, you're not going to get accounted to. So um, you can, you know, you can imagine with multiple projects over years and years with producers or mixers not having these things in place, um, they're leaving quite a lot of business, quite a lot of money on the table. Um, so you're talking about two kinds of letters of direction, a letter of direction with the label and a letter of direction with sound exchange, right? And in our deals, we've bundled them all together. So we have a, I don't know what you want to call it, sort of proprietary deal memo that we have refined over years and updated as times go on and, you know, um, uh, different technology emerges, whether it's streaming or, you know, lots of uh, artist releases through um, label services where the lion's share of that income goes to the artist and but then there's you know net receipts deductions etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're um, we're putting the producer agreement with a letter of direction that we have pre-drafted um, and also a sound exchange letter of direction which we have pre-drafted so that all the uh, artists and their team have to do is sign it provided we have no negotiations but when it comes to the LOD um, all they have to do is sign it and we're not in the business of then having to chase someone to draft an LOD let us see it make sure it's getting submitted we do it all at once the initial deal memo the uh, label letter of direction and the sound change LOD all at the same time anybody else want to comment on that or uh, fill in on that a little bit yeah I, I would just add you know what what that also does, and, and I think Jeremiah touched on it, I just want to drive it home for the people listening or watching, is not only does it instruct the label or, say, sound exchange to pay the writer or the producer directly, it's a direct statement that goes directly to the producer. They don't have to wait for it to come to the artist first, and then the artist accounts to you, hopefully, if they do their job. So you bypass any sort of delay you might get having to wait for an artist or someone else to get you the information. They directly account to you. You get a statement sent directly to your email and a check sent directly to your account as a producer. So no matter what the artist is doing, now you're dealing directly with the company and being paid and accounted to directly. Which is great, just to yes. jump on that, because most yeah. in most cases, um, while a lot of artists, certainly established artists, have business managers, they have teams of accountants and people who look after their books, um, they're typically not set up to account to producers right. or mixers. And so, you know, to be reliant on an artist, as Junior was saying, to account to you is, is a headache in waiting. Um, if you can get plugged into, you know, one of the major label um, royalty systems, you're going to get, uh, you know, paid to every six months like clockwork until something goes wrong. I and mean, then it does, you have to figure out why a statement doesn't show up after a while or whatever. But um, it's far, far, far more advantageous to be paid direct and accounted to direct by the label. So are contracts difficult to negotiate these days? Or is that a too broad a question? To say no, I think that it's just a matter of both parties being on the same page with major material terms. Um, you know, for the most part, if we're getting to a contract, it's because they they want something or they're happy with the product. So that being said, if you get to that point, you should be able to find, you know, a happy balance of material terms to move it forward. I, I think where it becomes more comprehensive is if, if we're doing more than just like a one-off or a one-song deal where we may be doing an overall project or an executive producer deal or something of that nature. Pretty much agreed, guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Do all, all of your clients have attorneys? Or do you? Hell no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all of them do for me. Um, do they see every agreement? Do they review it? Correct? No. Uh, I didn't ask if they read them. <laughs> Yeah, but they all, yes, but they all do have their own attorneys. 
And Joe, you said hell no. You're looking at him. About 4,000 degree, uh, 4,000 credits short of my law degree. <laughs> but, um, you know, doing this more than half my life. Um, I, I know how to read a, how to read a, a contract. contract. And I have, thank God, as everyone on, on the call does, we have lawyer friends that we can ask questions to. Um, in my world, it's, it's a struggle to get folks to uh, hire attorneys. And I'm not happy about it. Most of our friends are attorneys, but uh, dependent on the size of the deal, I've done book deals, TV shows, album deals. When it hits a certain threshold, my experience, our experience tells us you better get a lawyer. It's a little bit more than I could handle and I'm comfortable handling with legalese and everyone is okay with it. On mixes or smaller production jobs that are not six figure deals, I do that work. Same here. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's about right. Oh, and not wow. bragging at all, but it's 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 the business we're in. It's just the reality, you know. No, don't send it to them. You can just read it over. It's fine. It's just for two songs, and yeah. we've seen a thousand of them. So, for most cases, like I said, my clients they all have they all have attorneys, but they don't always see all their deals. A lot of them say, "No, you can just handle this one." Not all of them get to the attorney. Right. And in many cases, these deals are, it's, it's, uh, it's so repetitive anyway. I mean, yeah. you know, you're, you're dealing repeatedly with the same law firms. Yeah. Um, you're dealing repeatedly, you know, the same um, you know, set of terminology and language. And, you know, provided there's nothing, you know, completely out of left field, it's all, it's all fairly standardized at this yeah. point, this stuff. Um, yeah. And for us, it's like drilling in on what are the key um, elements of any contract, right? Like, how much is my client standing behind as an advance? What is my client's credit? Um, what is their share of uh, neighboring rights income? You know, what's the net receipt split and all these other things. So that if you, if you can really, you know, sort of zero in on those core things, I hate to say it, but the rest of it is a lot of, a lot of words on a page that mm -hmm. ultimately doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, I'm sure it does in some scenario, but um, like Joe says, like, yeah, and Junior, it's like if we can negotiate these smaller things. And, and frankly, our attorney friends and our uh, clients' attorneys are often really busy. And to have them, you know, turn their attention to a, you know, five-song mixer agreement, it means that I'm going to have to wait two or three weeks when I can negotiate it in, in an hour and send it back same day. And we're moving. It's, it's progressing the, the deal along and getting our clients paid. So sometimes the attorneys can actually slow the process down. God love them. But, um, you know, they're not as fast as us managers. Yeah. No. And things move fast these days and you have to be efficient. You got to be yeah. efficient. That's right. And my understanding is you have to get things right, like data-wise. Uh, someone said to me not long ago, if um, it, w there are so many sources that data has to go to now um, for to get, you know, our pennies or fractions of pennies from around the world, from all the different ways that music is used, that if you get it wrong in the beginning, you can't correct it. You'll never be able to correct all of it. Just something to think about. David, you look like you have questions to ask. I see you well, I... I do have several questions to ask. Um, uh, the The question that that I wanted to ask was uh, was the one that that I that I brought up earlier when we all had our pre con fab, which was we we've been, we've been talking very technically uh, right now. So now I want to now I want to go into a, another uh, another place and say what is the weirdest, craziest, strangest most excruciating or most awesome thing that you have had to do as a producer manager. Wow. Wait a minute, I have trouble hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, there's confidentiality hear? there, yeah. Oh. yeah there people See, won't without saying a client's name, but a, a pretty, you know, high-list artist had in like the 11th hour of releasing his album changed his first single. And it was really cool within a 12 to 15 hour window to have to turn around a single for this artist to perform on the Grammy stage. That right. was probably one of the most, like that was very memorable because I was still kind of in the junior early stages of my career. And it was just, that's, you have to learn fast. You learn fast, you learn what has to be delivered and you get it done. That was probably, again, without saying any names, one of um, a, a, a interesting 
experience. <laughs> Sounds like a rush. Yeah. I yeah. was in the studio once with a, with a producer client who we don't represent this person anymore, but um, was in his studio. He was in with a band and he was a, and remains a very, you know, incredible uh, producer, very sort of eccentric type person. Um, and he was concerned that the temperature in the room uh, in his own studio was fluctuating too much and he was he was he believed that he was able to discern a change in tone from the guitar that the guitarist was playing <laughs> and so he made me sure. sit there because I, I just happened to be there made me sit there with a thermometer <laughs> right in right in front of the guitarist while he was playing and, and getting this take and if the temperature dropped or rose no it was, if the temperature rose a degree or whatever cut crank the ac because he wanted to get the temperature in there just right because he believed that the composition of this guitar the wood and you know steel and everything else in this guitar was was changing degree by degree and he could hear it wow uh, so wow i mean it's so funny it's 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 so many stories it's just what can yeah. we <laughs> I, I, you can't name any names right so that's uh, appropriate <laughs> so, all right, so I'll just give one where a really, one of my clients, producer clients, really big producer client was in with this very big A-list artist and it was going to be the first time they were worked together um, in the same room. They had worked together previously, but they had sent files back and forth and, were, and they had success and it was a huge hit before. This time they happened to be in the same country at the same time. So they ended up going into the studio at the same time. I right at the beginning of the session um, and my producer client has a thing about making sure whatever session he's doing, it's fun. It's happy. He knows that that's when he makes hits. If it can't be like that, it just, it, it affects his spirit. He just, he just, he knows it's not going to be a good record. So here comes this big A-list artist who he's had already a huge number one hit with already to start a session. And Meeting in person was completely 180 what the experience was over, you know, the internet and sending files. Complete, uh, what I say, diva, diva, uh, demanding, um, had all kinds of requests, who could be in a room, who couldn't be in a room, um, could only have the light on and so much. They had to take people, it just completely threw him off. Like he, he literally wanted to leave, like right at the beginning. He didn't, he didn't want to do the session. There was no, but there was no way we could not not do the session. It had to happen. So wow. the, the, it took about four hours, but getting through, being able to get vocals done on this song and getting it finished where I knew that he had spiritually, mentally checked out, didn't wow. want to be there at all and hated it. And he, he would rather give up the money than do it. But we knew we had to do it because it was for a project. But that was just, this was, wow. was, was this in Spain? Oh. I think it was in Spain. But yeah. That was, that was an experience. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's something that you wouldn't expect. Did, did the song end up uh, be, being a hit or? Uh, no, no, it, no. Never, it never came <laughs> yeah. out. It didn't happen. And right. it, 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 it didn't happen, but yeah. It, not no. surprising. Right. Not, uh, no. When that's yeah. the vibe. Yeah. That's something, Joe. Yeah, Joe. Well, I know Joe has something, but we'll you know, say got, got something. Lots of drums, but. <laughs> we don't have enough time, and, and mm -hmm. I still need to work to make a living, so I'm going <laughs> to pass the baton for the next question. Do <laughs> you have time for more questions, David? I, I, ha I personally have two more questions okay. that, that I, I really want to get to. Um, is Everyone here talked about um, uh, networking. And I want to know, and and uh, it's, I want to know if that is something that has drastically altered for you now that we're uh, in this pandemic, and uh, and all people's social habits have changed, uh, or is networking still still going full speed ahead? Like, yeah, how is networking the same, and how has it changed for you right now? I'll take that. I'll start off. Um, it's changed a lot for me, David. Um, as Maya, who knows me best with Maureen on this call, um, I, I go to West Coast four times a year, Nashville twice a year, Toronto twice a year. And since February, I haven't gone anywhere. I live outside New York City. 
I go to my office, which is eight miles away. Um, but it, it, it has affected me a great deal because part of the gift that everyone on this call has is being in front of someone and speaking passionately about the people you represent. And Zoom works to a point for my business. Um, and you're in the hallways of Atlantic or Sony or Def Jam and you walk into people and you're introduced to other people. Uh, that in my world hasn't happened since COVID. Uh, and I think about it all the time. And I try to go around certain different ways, but it, it has changed it a bit. I think Junior's nodding his head. Well, I was nodding that it's, he, he, he hit the nail on the head. You, you, you set up one meeting, um, and then once you get in the building, I mean, that's like a thing. Like, all right, I, I was in the Def Jam building. I was in the Universal building. Because you go for one, but you end up having four or five micro meetings just being in the building running into this person, oh, I'm here, such and such. So you go there for one, you really leave the building with the result of maybe meeting with four people. Um, and the topic of conversation is your client because that's why you're there. So that piece of sort of face-to-face, -face, running into folks, whether it's a, an engagement or an event, those little micro meetings that might take you three or four phone calls to get that person on the phone, you can get done in like literally two minutes what you were trying to do in a week when you run into someone, it, it really, and it cuts to the chase. It brings whatever matter you're dealing with front of mind for that person so that the next time you call them, cause you just ran into the response is quicker. You get right to what you want to discuss. So that definitely has affected, you know, the networking part. Zoom is great. You know, emails and calls is st there's still enough going on, but that interaction there, those interactions that happen, th that definitely hurts not having that. You're, sure. You're making me think of when I was working in artist management and we used to joke that the, the labels would decide, um, uh, would make what they would call us with suggestions to produce the band. Right. Uh, and we, we would joke that it was the first last thing that had crossed their desk or the last person they had seen was the idea that they had. That they <laughs> well, so this would be a great producer for your band. That's right. That's right. There's something to that. There is something to that. That's like so you true. were just saying, it's like, yeah. You know, you were the last meeting, you're on the top of their minds, That's right. um, you know, and, and yeah, this, this pandemic has, has dramatically impacted my ability to network. I mean, we still do it. I pick up the phone and we're on email and, you know, doing Zooms and stuff. But like, yeah, like Joe was saying, I do New York trips three, four times a year, Nashville three times a year. Um, I'm, you know, oftentimes in London at least twice or three times a year. And when I set up those meetings, I'm always going to see the people who I, who I know and have good relationships with, but I'm also reaching out to people that I've never met before and saying, Hey, I'm going to be in your town and I want to come and meet and talk about your projects and get to know you and introduce you to my roster and stuff. So it's a, a lot of uh, trying to develop new relationships and new business, new connections with people. And just the plain fact that we can't really travel freely has had a massive impact on that. I'm excited to get back to it when that's possible, but um, there's no substitute for being in person. Yeah, uh, and I'll just add, uh, you know, I learned this from an a &R guy that I was learned under this guy named John McClain. Like, uh, I, worked for him, I worked for him at A&M. He was never in the office. Like, he was never in the office, right? I'm like, why is he never in the office? And, and I ended up having to meet with him at a restaurant. And then he told me, no deals get done in the office. Deals aren't done in the office. You close a deal in the office. You can get the paperwork done in the office. You, but it's me. You got to be out and meeting people, and you've got to be in front of folks. And that's yep. where things get cemented. That's where things happen. So that's the piece that's missing right now. That is very helpful. Yeah. Um, so it's it, it's 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 a big loss, really, at this point in terms of just momentum that you would have not having sure. that around. Trina, yeah, go on. Yeah, I, I agree you wanted to say something. Especially on the momentum, that's a really good point because that, that, that momentum is so important to be able to leverage opportunities. However, I will say the only, I don't know if upside is the right word, but it's the one that's coming to mind is being able to get more done in a day because I'm not spending as many hours commuting. True. So some people that may have taken a few weeks to get a meeting with, they're a little bit more available because they're crunching a lot more in one day because it's all virtual. That would probably be the only upside to this. Um, but I, I personally just miss interacting with people or 
going to, you know, the, the, whatever it may be, Soul House or, you know, you go to Soul House for a lunch and you end up right. in other meetings. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's like know? four meetings. So I, I did miss that sense of community and seeing that, you know, half our industry is working, half of them aren't working, but <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a good time, yeah. I'm in New York. You guys are almost making me want to go to L.A. <laughs> it sounds you very have, L.A. Did you have one other question, David? Yes, I have one last question, um, which is this has been this conversation has been very centered on what do producers and mixers need to know about working with you. But I also want to take into account that some people may be watching this and thinking that they want to become producer managers like you are. Um, if, if there are people viewing this, what advice would you give them uh, if they're considering this as a career? Okay. Yes, Joe. If, if you're in college and you need an internship, a lot of our interns get great jobs. I don't know why, but they get really great jobs and go on to great things. Um, if you're not in college and you're just someone who wants to switch careers, just give us a call. I, I, you know, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I think I can a little bit. And we'll talk to you about it to see if you have the metal of the makeup and the desire and the drive to do what we do, which is a lifestyle. It's not a job. Yeah. So I will add for me, if this is the path you want to take, I took, I took this path because I like being a part of the making of the record and developing of the artist process in the music industry. Some people like the end product and promoting it and being on the ends. I like being at the beginning process where, you know, it's created. So that starts with the artists and the songwriters and the producers. So if you are in that sort of, uh, have that creative juice to want to be involved in developing sounds and songs and the artists this is a good place to be because having done A&R for years the, I've made more records as a producer manager and artist manager than I did ever did as an A&R person at a record label I ended up managing production deals and timelines and so on doing A&R to label but the true artist development starts on this ground floor here with the writers and producers and the artists so if you like that process then managing producers could be a good thing for you but you need to Ask yourself first, is this the space you want to be in? That's solid advice. Trina. Add to that by saying, you know, just even currently there are a lot of producer managers that are just kind of connecting dots creatively, but the mi biggest missing gap that they have is understanding the business and how everything flows. It's so important because... For the most part, a lot of the creatives that I work with, they, to be quite frank, they can get themselves in some rooms, them, you know, just on their own relationships or people appreciating the creative value that they bring into the room. However, it's knowing where you can fill the gap. I've built a business off of filling the gap and, and providing what they already don't know, which is the infrastructure, the flow, and how to maximize their opportunities um, on not only just the front end, but the back end as well. So Absolutely. Can, yeah. A lot of YouTube videos, join, you know, these panels, ask questions, internships, as Joe said, is a really great way to start <laughs> to round it off. Yes. Yes. This video. Uh, it, it, Jeremiah, how about you? Yeah, I, I would I would echo what Tina just said. I, I think it's it's one thing to be um, kind of, you know, connected, have relationships, be able to connect dots, introduce people, et cetera, et cetera. But that's really only one rather small slice of the total pie. Um, we are dealing with so much more than that uh, on an administrative and business side. Um, all of the, everything from song registrations to contract negotiations to ensuring that, you know, our producers and mixers are being um, appropriately accounted to, tracking down accountings when they come missing, um, and all of the other myriad things that, um, are actually going to drive the income of a producer, uh, which then subsequently becomes your income because you're working on commission. Um, if you don't know the business, 
and you can't uh, successfully navigate the business, you're going to have a harder time. So that's a, that's a pretty intense kind of requirement is to really understand not only the record making process, um, like Junior was saying, sort of that from inception of songs, you know, all the way through to, um, to an end, end result. Uh, if you don't understand the record making process, that's critical to, to really immerse yourself in, but also on the business side. And um, it's interesting on the, the uh, intern comment, um, a guy that works for me, Colin, um, who is a manager here at GPS, uh, came to the company through the Berkeley School of Music intern program. And he did such a killer job in his internship that I offered him a job once he graduated. And he has worked here ever since, and we're going on seven years. So um, he immersed himself in the business. He um, literally went to school for it. And then when he came out, he sought a practical application for all those you know, classes and everything else. And um, Colin's a fantastic manager, and he's a massive asset to this company. But if you don't, if you don't know the business and you don't know the process, you're going to have a you're going to have a harder time gaining some momentum of your own as a manager of producers and mixers. I remember yeah, what I said at the beginning: nobody that nobody works harder than the producers and the engineers than the managers. The managers are the only ones that work harder than they do. It should be pretty obvious now. <laughs> what? And I, and I was going to say, for people listening, you know, I started as an intern. Like, I interned at a music publishing company right out of college. I, I was burning CDs for a publisher that was sending them out. I learned the catalog by burning the CDs, and that's how I learned how to match a song with an artist. It was an internship I did it for six months. And the deal was, if I did great, he would introduce me to people in the, uh, in, in the business and create some relationships. And he kept his word. I went out and got my first job from that internship. So it's, it's a great place to start and learn, really learn the business. Well, I, I think everyone here has served as a tremendous mentor today. Uh, and I know I, I'm extremely grateful for the time everyone here put into the panel. Uh, and I think everyone who's watching this is going to come away with a much more thorough understanding of what producer managers do and, and everything you do to really make the music happen that we that we hear uh and and i hope they're going to be more aware of that and uh, and and get inspired uh in a, in a number of ways maureen is it is there anything else you'd like to say to to cap things off anything we should have asked you that we didn't <laughs> covered a lot no, mm. I, it was a lot. Pretty <laughs> thorough. Well, we could do another hour, but yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm just um, fond of all of you and also inspired by all of you. So, and rely on all of you to, you know, people who do what you do to keep me informed about what's happening in the industry, what the issues are for producers and engineers, and, um, and uh, how to make their lives better if we can. Yeah. We try. Thank you refreshing to speak to other producer managers as well we're few and far between so That's i feel right. like i have a new community <laughs> there you great. go yeah great all right well we're glad we could get all you together everyone out there in mixcon land thank you for joining us being a part of this amazing panel once again junior joe jeremiah trina and maureen thanks for all the time you put into it and have a great day, night, morning, wherever you are, and we will talk to you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye, Maureen. Thank you. Bye-bye.